This is the issue. A lot of us are arguing over our Heavenly Father's name, but here's the question. What context, listen carefully, please my Father, my King, please guide me. In what context are we arguing over his name? Do you see this? In what context are we arguing over his name? Now, for those of you, when you look at what is known as the third person, what you will see is, mind you now, for those of you who know, the four, the four vowels, as they say, the, they call it the tetragrammaton. You have the yod, he, wa, he. Now, mind you now, Josephus said that there are four vowels. But of course, in English, what the scholars say is that it's four consonants. So these letters are vowels now. Now, the interesting thing about this is that when it is translated, scholars will translate our father's name as he, he that exists. Or according to scripture, it will say he who, he who is and was and is to come. You'll find that in Revelations. In the book of Revelations chapter 1, you'll find that. So, the question is, what are we arguing over? Is it that our Heavenly Father's name, as it's being expressed, is it in the third person? He exists. Do you see this? Now, just to read this to you, and you all can look at it for yourself, for those of you who can see with me. But um, it's regarding the two expressions, who and he, which is, per, which is referring to as a third person pronoun, which can be referred to in modern Hebrew. In Israel today, it, it can be referred to uh, who can be referred to a. Um, please help me, my father, my king, so the information is right. Who can be referred to a male, and he can be referred to a female. Now, what's very interesting is I'm I'm reading here where it says. It gives an example. Of how in Arabic and even the Syriac tongue, which is families to the Hebrew, it is a Semitic language. It gives a vocalization and it says, Yahuwah. Now, I'm not holding up this book, Jacinius, to say that this is why it's Yahuwah. But what I am saying is that the, these certain scholars that had this knowledge, they understood that these were Semitic languages and that they all flowed together. They had certain influences. It was a mixture of the languages. Do you see this, my brothers and sisters? This is a Semitic tongue now. There is more than one Semitic tongue. And I'm going to hold up right here where you can see it. And for those of you who may have it, you'll see where my finger is. I don't know if you all can see that. It says, Yahuwah. And what it shows, it shows the Yod, the He, the Wa, and it shows the Aleph. Now, we know our father's name has that He on the end. But it says this, it says, it says the pronunciation Yahuwah shows that the Aleph was original and indicated an original vocalic termination of the two words. Now, what the Mesorites did in some cases, the word who and he, there are times when they would translate it uh, inter interchangeable. And you will find that on, again, I give you the page on the page 107. And it's the personal pronoun, that's the heading, and it's the third person section. You will find that information there, and, and I'm pressed for time, but you all can look at that, study to show yourself approved unto the Most High, and let may you be edified in that matter. But what I want to show you and share with you is that these type of issues, we're fighting over our Heavenly Father's name, but we're fighting over the, as far as the third person context, he that exists or he that is to be or to become. We're actually arguing over this and it's not getting us anywhere. You see, it's my brothers and sisters. So the name of our Heavenly Father, if we all desire to know it, we have to come to the Son in prayer, in study, 
in, as far as his word. And he'll give revelations to guide us to the right insights. Do you understand? But his name can be known if we truly want to know it. Now, <clears throat> another thing is, I want to make sure I cover this here. As far as um, our father's name is concerned. When you look at, when it says Ahaya, Asha Ahaya, when you see the Ahaya, Asha Ahaya, there's times where our Heavenly Father will refer to himself. And when he says, even in the scriptures, it will say uh, Anaki. So it's times when it will say Ahaya, it's personal. Him giving, as far as who he is, I am that I am, as far as it being translated. But what's so difficult is that the scholars have come up with different variations of his name. And so, according to the uh, Masoretes, we know that it's a name that has three syllables. Now, for some of you who say that Yahweh, that's how they pronounce it, actually, Jacinius actually vowel pointed it to where it has three syllables. To where it's, it's actually pronounced Yahweh. Yahweh. Do you see this? This is where people get the Yahweh from or Yahweh from. So when we have all these different names, all we have to do is go to our son, go to our king in prayer. Lay these things out before him. Open up his word. And if we really have a true relationship with him, this here, it can be solved easy. But it's based upon you. For those of you out there who have the different names. If you really love him, get on your knees and seek him. Do you see this, my brothers and sisters? And that's it for that, as far as the Father's name is concerned. Because we have to be able to go to him. Do you understand, my brothers and sisters? Now, another issue is understanding the scholars' agreement and disagreements. You see, that's the thing. We have to recognize that the people who translated this book, they had agreements and they had disagreements. Now, I'm going to read you something from the 1611. I have the 1611 King James Version. There's a lot of you out there who have that. And this is actually, just so you know, because there's different 1611s out there. I'm reading from the 400th year anniversary. Make sure I'm right. Some of you may have it. Uh, yes, yes, it's the uh, 400 year anniversary, anniversary, and it's from Hendrix Publishers. Now, if you all look on page, I'm reading from page 39, and this is the rules to be observed in the translation of the Bible. This is very interesting because it gives you the names of all the men that were involved, and it gives you the rules. Now, this is rule number one. It says, rule number one, the ordinary Bible read in the church, commonly called the Bishop's Bible, to be followed and as little altered as the truth of the original will permit. Rule number two, the names of the prophets and the holy writers with the other names of the text to be retained as nigh as may be accordingly as they were vulgarly used. Listen, rule number three, the old ecclesiastical words to be kept and it says, it's V-I-Z, that's a indication. It says the word church not to be translated congregation. Now that's something. We all need to think about that now. Listen now, rule number four. When a word have diverse significations, that to be kept which have been most commonly used by the most of the ancient fathers, being agreeable to the propriety of the place and the analogy of the faith. Rule number five, the division of the chapters to be altered, either not at all or as little as may be, if, if uh, necessity so require. Rule number six, no marginal notes at all to be affixed, but only for the explanation of the Hebrew or Greek words, which cannot, without some circum, circum, uh, look, excuse me, circumlocution, so briefly and fitly be expressed in the text. Rule number seven, such quotations of places to be marginally set down 
as shall serve for the fit reference of one scripture to another. Rule number eight, every particle, listen, rule number eight, it says every, every particular, thank you my father, my king, every particular man of each company to take the same chapter or chapters and having translated or amended them severally by himself, where he think if good, all to meet together, confer what they have done, and agree for their parts what shall stand. Rule number nine, as, as any one company have dispatched any one book in this manner, they shall send it to the rest to be considered of seriously and judiciously, for his majesty is very careful in this point. Rule number 10, if any company upon the review of the book so sent, doubt or differ upon any place to send them word thereof, note the place, and withal send the reasons to which if they consent not the difference to be compound, compounded at the general meeting, which is to be of the chief persons of each company at the end of the work. Rule number 11, when any place of special obscurity is doubted of, letters to be directed by authority, to send to any learned man in the land for his judgment of such a place. Rule number 12, letters to be sent from every bishop to the rest of his clergy, admonishing them of this translation in hand, and to move and charge as many as being skillful in the tongues, and having taken pains in, in that kind, to send his particular observations to the company, either at Westminster, Cambridge, or Oxford. Rule number 13, the, direct, the directors in each company to be the deans of Westminster and Chester of that place, and the king's professors in the Hebrew or Greek in either university. Rule number 14, these translations to be used when they agree better with the text than the Bishop's Bible. And they have listed here the Tinsdale, Matthews, Coverdale's, Witch Church, or Geneva. This is the last rule. Listen carefully. Rule 15, besides, besides the said directors before mentioned, three or four of the most ancient and grave divines, and either of the universities not employed in translating, to be assigned by the vice chancellor upon conference with the rest of the heads to be overseers of the translations as well, Hebrew as Greek, for the better observation of, of the fourth rule above specified. So I hope I didn't bog you down or bore you with that, but it had, it's a necessity to read it because what it goes to show is that there were 15 rules that the scholars that sat down to put together our authorized version had to abide by and they had to follow. You understand? So once we understand that there were agreements, these rules were made if there were agreements and also disagreements and how to rectify the situation. We all know by history that these men that came together, they did have disagreements amongst these, each other. These men were well educated. Many of them knew the Hebrew tongue, the Greek tongue. Uh, Latin, many of them knew the even the Arabic tongue. When you do your research, you'll find this out. So they had different belief systems, but yet they all was able to come together to make this eclectic work as far as the translation is concerned. So we all have to be able to understand this, my brothers and sisters. Now, another thing is with the uh, Mesorites is that there was a, a differentiation between the different schools. And I'll be reading to you from, this is a very uh, interesting book. Some of you out there who are well studied, you have this book here. And I'm going to be dealing with, as I find I can lead, the issues with the Mesorites. Now I'm going to be reading from, I'm reading from the, the uh, I'm reading from Time, People, and, excuse me, I'm sorry, The Scripts of the Ancient Near East. And this is regarding the where it says the square Hebrew script. Because a lot of us actually it's an issue with the actual tongue. Now listen here. It says here, and I'm reading the second, the uh, third paragraph. It says the Jews developed the Aramaic script. Again, I'm reading from the square Hebrew script. That's where I'm reading from. It says the Jews developed the Aramaic script into a more nearly square form. The alphabet still re remained at 22 letters, all consonants, but two ceased to have a sound value. 
and four increasingly were used as signs for long vowels as spoken Hebrew died out, except in the synagogue and the school. Do you see this? This is why when we look in our, excuse me, when we look at our lexical books, we'll see the Aleph and the Ayin as being silent letters. They do make a sound, but over time they were considered silent. Do you see this? This is one of the reasons why. And mind you what Josephus said about the four vowels. Now, it says here, during the Middle Ages, vowel systems, thank you, my father, my king, did you hear that? Not one vowel system, but more than one. Listen, it says, during the Middle Ages, vowel systems did develop in Jewish circles. They are known as the Babylonian, the Palestinian, and the Tiberian systems. In the Babylonian system, small consonantal letters were written above the line of the text to represent basic, long, and short vowels. The Palestinian system utilized dots, also placed above the line of the text, to represent various vowels. Both of these schemes are represented in both a few manuscripts. The Tiberian manner of symbolizing vowels was to arrange dots and dashes in varying varying combinations, and to place them both above the line of the text and below it. Some dots were placed within or beside the consonant. It is highly efficient and logical. It is a highly, excuse me, it is a highly efficient and logical method and has been the kind which has been preserved in most texts of the Hebrew Old Testament. The Tiberian mode also had a group of markings to indicate the accent patterns of each word. Synagogue scrolls never had any of these symbols. So what we're seeing here, my brothers and sisters, and this still, you know, it just correlates with our disagreements that we have, is that the Mesorites, it was different vowel systems. This is why you see certain words you have in the Mesoretic text, you have certain words that will be considered as a, a defective form and a full form. This is why you would have that. You would have actual different pronunciations. Do you understand? Now, I'm still in the same book, but I'm going over to, <clears throat> I'm reading from the Manuscripts and Mosaic Authorship. And I'm reading where it says the work, so you all will know where I'm reading from, page 207. And I'm reading from the work of the Meserite, the Meserites at Tiberias. It says, for centuries, it was normal for Hebrew manuscripts to be written with consonants only, as was true also of Phoenician and Aramaic inscriptions. The manuscripts and fragments from the Cairo Geniza and among the Ferkowitz collection reveal that along with these consonantal texts, there arose efforts to indicate vowel sounds as well. This procedure affected private copies, never the synagogue scrolls. The small signs that represented vowels were gradually added to consonantal Texts about the 6th or 7th century AD. Previously, vowels sounds were transmitted by memory from teacher to, pu to pu pupil. Now listen carefully, my brothers and sisters. It says, this method was not difficult while Hebrew was a spoken language, but variants in traditions of how to pronounce the consonantal text arose as the Jews were scattered far and wide in different native languages became their means of speech. The introduction of vowel and accent markings sort, sought to stabilize pronunciation. It became known as the vocalic or spoken text. Did you hear that? This is why even today, if you think about it, we have different dialects within the Mesoretic text. You have the Ashkenazi dialect. You have the Yemenite dialect. You have the Sephardic dialect. There are so many different dialects. It says, the manuscripts of the Cairo Genezer have witness to a Babylonian type of vocalization, of pointing. Fragments from the 7th and 8th century AD shows that six vowel marks were placed above the continental line. In the 8th and 9th centuries, a more complicated system of four abbreviated consonants and two other signs were placed above the line of consonants. These manuscripts also had specimens of a Palestinian type which had eight vowel signs, 
place above the line and dots employ for showing accent, accents of words. A faction of, listen to this, a faction of Orthodox Jewish scribes called Karaites. I'm sorry. I think I pronounced that right. Please help me find my king. Karaites is spelled Q-A-R-A-I-T-E-S. If you, those of you want to write it down. Seem to be largely responsible for this development. So did you hear that? So now we see that there were certain groups of them that did this, my brothers and sisters. During the 8th and 9th century, Jewish scholarship became concentrated at schools in Tiberias on the west bank of the Sea of Galilee. The scribes at this school became known as Meseret, the Meserites or Meseretists because they placed marginal notes on the pages of the text. These notes were called Masora. Hence, the title Meseretis de designates the tendency of these scribes to adhere closely to tradition. The Meserets felt dedicated to preserve the traditional text with all possible care. They studied many old manuscripts and made an up-to-date recension. Recension, do you see this? It says, which is known as the Meseretic text. This is the text that has been preserved in the West. The Meseretes found the Palestinian method of indicating vowels and accents inadequate. So they devised a careful fashion system of dots, dashes, and other markings, which are called points, which appeared in printed Hebrew Bibles today. The vowel points are made up of seven signs grouped in combinations and placed either in, under, or above the consonants. There are 32 accent marks. So, oh, excuse me, one more, one more piece. It says, the most prominent scribes of the Mesoretic schools were of the family of Ben Asher, and so important were their contributions to that Mesoretic text. It's sometimes called the Ben Asher text. The Codex Karen, I'm sorry, the Codex Karen, Karensis, I believe I pronounced that correctly, the, Co the uh, Aleppo Codex, the Codex Sinagrandinus, were all produced by the Ben Asher family. Do you see this, my brothers and sisters? And again, this is the book, the Pentateuch and its cultural environment. And it says uh, G. Herbert Livingston. I have this is I believe this is the I have the some of y'all out there may have the second. I have the first edition. I was blessed to have the first edition. Some of you may have the second or third or fourth or fifth. But what I'm saying is, is that my brothers and sisters, we have to understand that these are eclectical works. And if we learn how to navigate properly, we'll be able to have an understanding of why our texts read the way that it does. And this can alleviate a lot of the foolishness that's going on out here in the body of the Messiah. So, again, and as far as time is concerned, it will be brought to a close for now. But as I find my king lead, in their time, we will continue to go over the different issues that's in the body of the Messiah and that our Father King will provide the proper counsel so that we all can adhere and be able to take these things back into consideration and be able to deal with the problems at hand. I love you my brothers and sisters. I thank you for at least bearing with me to be able to listen to the information and hopefully you all can understand that these things that are happening if we just allow our Heavenly Father and our King to help us to overcome the situation, a lot of the damage that has been done, a lot of the schisms and the different wounds that have been uh, actually manifested in the body of the Messiah, we'll be able to heal from these things. But we have to deal with this because, my brothers and sisters, what this is going to do is going to weed out the tares among us. See, there's a lot of people here who... I'm sure we'll be listening and we'll try to leave their foolish comments, and I'm not moved by that. Your comments, they can stay up there. My father, my king, has commanded me not to even go back, back and forth with any of you who are enemies out here. But what it's going to do is going to weed them out. Because a lot of people who are not lovers of the truth, my brothers and sisters who are, they're not going to really take the time to sit down and really apply these things, to go into their prayer closets, and to be able to really seek our father, my king, on the matter. They're going to brush this stuff off. And that's, it's, I'm, I so, I'm so thankful for our final king to actually bring this message this way. But for those of you who really are lovers of the truth, those of you who really have the fruits of the spirit, you'll be able to, be able, you'll be able to go back 
write, search, more importantly, pray, study, and you'll be able to receive everything that's being led to, to uh, come to you today. You understand? So anyway, I love you. <coughs> Excuse me. May you all be edified and may you continue to grow and I hope that you conquer those barricades that are before you. In, in the name of our Father, in the name of our King, in the name of Yahushua and His Father, Yahuwah, through the set-apart spirit. I love you, my brothers and sisters. Take care.